it looks from the information that we have that it's uh, fairly certain that the uh, that the uh, Fitzgerald went down. Air and sea search is continuing for possible survivors of the Edmund Fitzgerald, a 729-foot ore carrier, which apparently broke apart and sunk last night on Lake Superior. He had a lift and he said he was holding his own. Uh, the last time I talked with him, he said he was holding his own. And God, I'm afraid that I'm going to take a hell of a beating out there. Good evening and thank you for joining me. I'm Kyle Gillette. Tonight we will remember 29 good men in their final journey across the raging seas of the largest Great Lake. Tonight we will discover how the waves turned the minutes to hours and how in the blink of an eye the worst of our imaginations became reality. Mysteries always have a way of captivating people and for the population of the Great Lakes our greatest mystery lies 535 feet below Lake Superior. It's the mighty and unsinkable Edmund Fitzgerald. The ship was the pride of the American side coming back from the 729 foot oar carrier was known across the Great Lakes for her size, beauty and strength. She set records and drew crowds. She was the pride of the American side until the Witch of November cast her curse on the mighty freighter on a dark night on an angry Lake Superior in 1975. The Great Lakes region held its breath on a cold and blustery evening, clung to television screens and radios waiting for word of survivors. However, that word would never come. Most estimations suggest nearly 6,000 shipwrecks lay on the floor of the Great Lakes dating back to at least 1679 when the Le Griffin went down on her first voyage somewhere in Lake Michigan. I was able to sit down with Central Michigan University Professor of History, Dr. Jay Martin, to discuss the history, importance, beauty, and fury of our Great Lakes. I'm a historian, maritime historian. I'm also a maritime archaeologist specializing in the Great Lakes, but I'm also a lake sailor. I was a deckhand first on tugboats and then later on uh, I ended my career on a thousand foot lake ship. What ship was that? So that was the motor vessel Ogilby Norton oh, okay. in 1995. Of course I remember as a kid when the Edmund Fitzgerald went down, I remember very well hearing about it on the radio and in the evening news. So I remember that personal experience and how shocking it was to everybody at a time because we had assumed that the technology had grown to the point where we would never lose a, a big ship on the Great Lakes. It was just assumed that was the case. So when the Fitzgerald was lost it was big news. The Fitzgerald was launched at River Rogue, Michigan in 1958 as the longest ship of the inland seas. The name Edmund Fitzgerald came from the president of the company who purchased her. And for the first time the lakes would be tamed by the Fitzgerald, that would be September of the same year. Now, the primary duty of the Fitzgerald was to transport iron ore taconite pellets from ports in Wisconsin and Minnesota to ports near Detroit and Toledo. She was responsible for many record loads throughout her 17-year career on the lakes, and the largest cargo she ever carried in her belly was over 27,000 tons of iron ore taconite. But the Fitzgerald for its time carried very large cargoes. It had a special reputation, not only because it was the newest and the biggest at the time, but it had a very pretty design. It was a good-looking ship, and boat fans loved that. It happened to have uh, captains who had personalities. Uh, they played up to the crowd as they passed the Sulox and other things. But it was a substantial vessel. It was well built. It was well crewed. Um, the crew were well, well respected. The Great Lakes have had a number of infamous storms and shipwrecks over the hundreds of years of their use for shipping. Other famous shipwrecks include the White Hurricane Storm of 1913, where an estimated nine ships and 250 lives were lost. The Carl D. Bradley with two survivors in Lake Michigan in 1958 and the Daniel J. Morrell in Lake Huron in 1966 with only one survivor. And yet the Fitzgerald gathers the most attention of them all. Most likely thanks to the 1976 Gordon Lightfoot hit, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. The Edmund Fitzgerald is so closely tied to the song by Gordon Lightfoot, which is so popular uh, that, that that really keeps the story alive. It was definitely the song 
And that was combined with the fact that, you know, in 1975, we all thought the technology was so great that we would never lose a ship again. Why? We'd overcome nature. We knew that our ships were going to be safe, that our mariners were the best. And it turned out not entirely to be true. Mariners of the Great Lakes know all too well the dangers of shipping life on the inland seas, and it's not only where they work, it's where they live. And for those of us on the shores, we can see the impacts on our lives in a number of ways, and one of the biggest is our industry. The, the portions of Ontario and the United States are so populous and have so much industry is because of the Great Lakes. Even in Native American times, the primary uh, reliable way to, to get from one place to another, at least quickly, was over water. Uh, it's not surprising that there were a tremendous number of vessels that were used here and that uh, some of them were lost. That The very nature of the Great Lakes as a system is kind of unusual, which allows the winds to build up big waves um, and create havoc with shipping, right? Extremely large waves. On the evening of November 10th, 1975, those waves would be enough to bring down the mighty Fitzgerald and all 29 of her crew, driving the vessel into bedrock and breaking in half beneath the icy waters of an eastern Lake Superior. The beginning of the final Fitzgerald voyage would start on a warm and quiet day in Superior, Wisconsin on the 9th of November, 1975. Around 8 a.m., the Fitz was being loaded with 26,000 tons of iron ore taconite pellets that would be headed for a port in Detroit. Later that afternoon, she would depart Superior, Wisconsin, leaving behind safe harbor from the lake's wrath for the last time. Around the same time that afternoon, the Laker SS Arthur M. Anderson and her captain Bernie Cooper were also leaving the port on a similar path of the Fitz. They both decided to take a longer northern route across the lake in hopes that the Canadian shoreline would provide some cover, and over the next 30 hours, the two freighters would battle the lake's waves together. For the rest of November 9th, the two ships would march their way across western Lake Superior, and by the morning of November 10th, the ships were passing Isle Royale. The Fitzgerald would submit its final weather report of winds of 40 miles per hour and waves of 10 feet high. The lake was beginning to churn. There was uh, a period of really good weather, beautiful weather, unseasonably warm weather, and Captain sailed based on what they knew about the weather at the time, and then in the course of a trip across a lake, wham! When I was sailing, I remember being in northern Lake Michigan on a beautiful sunny day and we could see a storm, a squall coming. It looked, got bigger and bigger and worse and worse as we got, got closer. Um, and uh, in no time, we went from, from five mile an hour winds to 65 and then 70, then, you know, greater winds. Our radar went out, all we had was you know, our basic ability to, to navigate, knowing where we were, what direction we had to go. As the ships begin their southward turn, which points them towards the safety of Whitefish Bay, both vessels battled rough conditions as they made a pass by Caribou Island and the poorly charted Six Fathom Shoals. Shortly after 3 p.m., Captain Cooper of the Anderson said to a shipmate, the Fitzgerald is much closer to the shoals than I'd want us to be. Six Fathom Shoal or Caribou Shoal is an area of bedrock ridges that rise up to only 11 feet below the water surrounding portions of Caribou Island. It's possible that the Fitzgerald crossed over these shoals as it passed Caribou Island and potentially ran aground, doing damage to the underside of the vessel. Is it possible that the Fitzgerald actually did hit the shoal? The shoal itself, there's, you know, there's a depth of water. Um, but when you have big waves, the water goes up and the water goes down. There's variability there. So as a ship is passing over, something that they could have gone over uh, under on, when there were their calm conditions in weather, suddenly, bam, you can come down on it. So it's very possible he could have hit Caribou Shoal. Most sailors believe that's what happened. I, I don't care what anybody says. At 3.10 in the afternoon, she had either bottomed out or had a stress fracture of the hull. It, it's the only two possibilities to have. She was sinking from that time on. By this time, things were starting to take a turn. 
It wasn't long after that that Fitzgerald reported that she was rolling to one side and taking on some water. Captain McSorley was using pumps aboard the ship to help with the issue. He said, I've got two vents missing, and I've taken a starboard list. Now, that immediate list, again, tells me that he either had a stress fracture or he bottomed out. He said he had his pumps on, and I asked him if he had, I asked him if he had his pumps on, and he said yes. Within an hour, though, the vessel would again report an issue to her following fellow mariners. At this time, she had lost both radars. His radar is out. He's having trouble navigating. The navigational beacon uh, at Whitefish Point is out, so he's not able to properly navigate. And the Anderson was trying to help him stay in the clear. Over the next couple of hours, the two ships would battle ferocious seas on eastern Lake Superior as they made their way towards the safety of Whitefish Bay. In radio transmissions overheard from other vessels in the area, Fitzgerald's Captain McSorley said, this is one of the worst seas I've ever been in. Most of us know our cars well enough that if we hear a clunk or a bang, we know something that's unusual, doesn't make the right sound, there's something wrong with it. He could tell through the soles of his shoes what were, was happening to this ship. He clearly knew that there was a serious problem. No one that I talked to that knew him, knew him personally, thought of him as somebody who was exceptional in the way he handled the ship or that he operated it in a way that was unsafe. He had an excellent reputation. He was a good mariner. He was a good man. If there was a place that he could have brought the ship in and grounded it, so to save it, if he thought that it was in dire, in a dire condition, he would have done that. If he could have gotten it into shelter anywhere, he would have done that. Going across Lake Superior, where he was, as things started to go wrong, there was no shelter for him. His only ability was to get it behind Whitefish Point, to get it someplace where it was in shelter, and he was doing his very best to do that. By now, the conditions that the two freighters were battling on that November evening were the worst of the day. Hurricane force winds blowing across the lake from the northwest allowed waves to build to 20 to 35 feet, with some rogue waves likely higher. The ships were battling quickly falling temperatures, freezing spray, and off and on bursts of freezing rain and heavy snow. With all that extra water on deck at times, I had as much as 12 feet on my deck at times. And uh, I know my, my, my hatch crane was completely buried a few times. Because that Fitzgerald lost both of her radars, at 7.10 p.m., the Anderson reported another vessel that was approaching from the south. And during the conversation, Anderson asked the Fitz, by the way, Fitzgerald, how are you making out with your problem? Well, the final words from the mighty Fitz would be the response, we're holding our own. The Anderson would sign off with, I'll be talking to you later. The very last transmission that he made was, we're holding our own, which is his indication that, that he thought they were going to make it. And uh, then Morgan had his an afterthought, I said, how are you doing? He said, we're holding our own. That was at 710. That was the last transmission we had from him. He had, he had no, showed no signs of panic. I mean, he was calm. So uh, I, 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 like I firmly believe, I think that he thought that ship was going to get him through. Sometime around 7.15 p.m., a squall moved across the lake, obscuring Anderson's view of the ship, both visually and on radar. When the squall cleared, the Anderson searched for the lights of the Fitzgerald ahead of them, but those lights would never be found. Within a relatively short period of time, minutes really, um, the ship goes into a squall, and then when the squall clears and attempts to find it on radar or to talk to it via radio telephone, uh, they fail, it's not there. When other ships are following pass through that space, they don't see it. They keep a, a lookout, they see nothing. The best conclusion we can draw from that is that it did go down very, very quickly. Does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn the minutes to hours? For the remainder of the 7 o'clock hour, the Anderson would continue its search as it made its way for the safety of Whitefish Bay. Captain Cooper of the Anderson called the Coast Guard to alert them of the 729-foot missing vessel twice over the next 40 minutes. 
By 9 p.m., the Coast Guard would request Captain Cooper to head back out in the violent storm to search for the vessel again. Then head into the sea and try to stay in that area. Uh, and maybe we could pick up some survivors. If not at night, then maybe at first light. Over. And the Coast Guard um, radios to him and can you, Captain, can you go back? Can you we request you take your ship back out and look for the Fitzgerald? And he keys the mic and he go, you hear him go, uh, and then he unkeys it. And then there's a moment or two and then he comes back and he says, okay. So he did it uh, and other ships did it as well, but they didn't take it lightly. This was a very, very serious ma matter. Uh, one of those once in a century storms. Captain Norad, he asked me if I'd personally go back out and I, I was reluctant to go, really I was. But he said, there's a ship on the bottom, and I felt like saying there could be two if I go back, you know, but I finally decided I'd go out. There's that question, like, oh yeah, the Anderson was right behind it. Well, why didn't the Anderson have any issues? Could it have just been that one wave, or, you know, was there something going on with the Fitzgerald at the time? So I think that gets close to answering that question, that yes, something was seriously wrong at the time. There clearly, the hull's clearly got problems as it works its way, way along. At some point, it just didn't have enough buoyancy to resist whatever it was facing. Whatever happened, it happened very quickly and the ship went to the bottom before the crew could really respond. Despite the search efforts of the Anderson and other vessels such as the SS William Clay Ford, no survivors would ever be found. The mighty Fitzgerald, 729 feet of steel, 26,000 tons of iron ore, and most importantly and tragically, 29 good men were lost. Late that night, as other vessels and Coast Guard crews battled the seas trying to locate the ship and her crew, news outlets across the Great Lakes region would pick up the story of the missing freighter. From that point on, debate would be sparked and theories developed all around the question, why did the Edmund Fitzgerald go down? Throughout the coming days, the Coast Guard would continue the search for the Fitzgerald, hoping for any signs of life. Some unrealized hope would come from a number of Fitzgerald's items that were recovered or washed ashore. These items included a life raft, two mangled 40-foot lifeboats, a stool, a ring buoy, a sounding board, and other various items. However, these artifacts would not contribute to any leads other than the assumption that the Fitzgerald went down hard and fast. They weren't able to, to put out a radio call, they weren't able to, to get over the side, there's no flare, there's none of the things that you would expect. Nobody tried to get out. That means everything happened quickly. The steel is just mangled like if I crinkled up some paper. So it, that doesn't happen if it just kind of floats down to the bottom. So it must have hit incredibly hard. knows for sure some combination of the weather with structural failure is the best guess. Even the men who are on board the ship probably don't really know all that happened. It's no sign of anybody else. I think it was sudden and catastrophic. I mean, he just, the ship just disappeared completely. All you had to do was pick up the phone and say, mayday, mayday. And uh, there's nothing, you know, I mean, uh, I think they were going under and they thought it was a big wave. I think they just kept going. Um, what is unusual is the fact that it, it, the bow goes in, the stern somehow, the midsection is crushed, it flips over, and they end up on the bottom with the stern inverted, so upside down. So it's very possible that the bow uh, submarined and that the captain and the mates, uh, the deckhands, uh, the watchmen, were probably all killed instantly when that happened. But the stern could have actually dangled for a while and rolled over, been pulled under by the bow as it came down. 
Um, so, and, and because it was enclosed, it's very possible that the folks that were on board that actually survived for a time. It's a terrible place to die. would be officially identified by a team using a special submarine after the spring thaw in May of 1976. The official report from the Coast Guard detailing their most likely cause of the wreck was released in 1977 with the cause being that hatch clamps were not properly secured. These hatch clamps hold down the cargo hatch covers, however mariners far and wide disagree. So theories about why the Edmund Fitzgerald sank or how it sank, uh, there's, there are a ton of them. The craziest is that aliens came and took them and in the process of taking them off the ship, the ship collapsed and sank. Um, the, the more likely ones include structural failure. It might have hit Caribou Shoal and damaged its bottom and slowly worked its way apart. That's one of the, the better theories. Um, there are other theories uh, that, that relate to um, everything, including hatch clamps, right? Problems with the hatch clamps. So hatches, of course, are those elongated rectangles that, that are opened up to put cargo in and take cargo out. They're so heavy that under most circumstances, they would not come off. The, the wind can't blow them off. They're very, very heavy. And they're made that way for a purpose, so they seal very tightly. The hatch clamps are insurance to make sure that the pressure of water and wind can't together dislodge them. The, the original Coast Guard investigation comes back and it came back and, and blamed that as an issue. Um, and Lake Sailors and the Lake Carriers Association came back solidly against that and said, there's just no way that this experienced crew or any other in November wouldn't have properly secured their hatches. Captain McSorley would not have allowed his ship to, to sail if he didn't think that everything was ship shape. Could the crewmen have made some kind of error? It's possible. Is it likely? Probably not. So with today's technology, here we are again where we don't think that could happen again. Is there still some sort of possibility, especially with an older ship that just gets caught in the wrong conditions, do you think something like that could happen again if we're not totally careful? The average age of a, of a ship on, on the Great Lakes that's still operational is over 50 years. It's common on saltwater to retire a ship after about 20 years. We keep them operating here and sometimes keep them running for over 100 years. I, it's absolutely certain that another large ship will be lost someday on the Great Lakes. It's really only a matter of time before it, it occurs again. Let's hope it's a long time in the future, and let's hope that the crew is able to, to survive. The legend of the Fitzgerald lives on today. Through the song by Gordon Lightfoot, through ceremonies and memorials, through the remembrance of family members, and through stories told by Great Lakes Mariners. This is not just a story of the sudden disappearance of an unsinkable ship. It's a story of 29 good men, 29 good mariners that represent the courage and dedication of Great Lakes sailors, past and present. Sol G. Haskell, second assistant engineer. In a musty old hall in Detroit, they prayed in the Maritime Sailors Cathedral. Church bell chimed till it rang 29 times for each man on the Edmund Fitzgerald. And the legend lives on from the Chippewa on down of the big lake they call Gitchagumi. Superior, they said, never gives up the dead when the gales of November 